Good afternoon, everybody, to another exciting episode of BWHR Voices. Today, we welcome Piyush Mehta, CHRO, Genpak. We welcome you on board, sir. It's a pleasure for us to be speaking with you and for you to taking out time for us amidst your busy schedule. Um, Thank you, Sugan. Wonderful to be back with you, um, you know, uh, and great to spend time on, um, you know, things uh, that you'd want to talk about in the talent space. Thank you so much, sir. For everyone today to know what exactly we'll be talking about. So today our topic of discussion is internal workforce upskilling, the need of the hour. Just to give a synopsis of what we'll be talking about, I feel the need for employees to upskill and reskill is becoming increasingly important, especially in the last few years. Employment rates are dropping because of economy and the newer people entering into the field and one has to adapt to the changes as they come. Skill development has always been a crucial part of the employment process, but in the past few years, with the pandemic, the process of digitization has been expedited, which has led to reducing the shelf life of technological skills and also increasing the risks of being redundant. Due to these reasons, upskilling has become an integral part of employment and can no longer be an afterthought. I open the forum to you, Mr. Mehta, with my first question, what in your view, you know, what's your view on upskilling employees and its importance with respect to increasing attrition and competition with other service providers, IT service providers, so as to say? Yeah, Sugat, I think this question, um, the context for this question is beyond just IT service providers. The context of this question is broader to pretty much any employer, okay, uh, and any corporate. Uh, mm -hmm. To us, um, we believe that, um, you know, upskilling uh, and um, um, learning for our talent is a competitive differentiator, differentiator and a very meaningful competitive differentiator. See, again, I, our philosophy to this is uh, simple. People come to work uh, for the quality of work. People come to work for the quality of manager. People come to work for the quality of learning and development that they get. And people come to work for the purpose which, which the company exists. Okay. Mm -hmm. Those are really the four reasons why we believe people will come to work. And I don't think those have changed in the last 40 years, 50 years. Okay. Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, upskilling, learning, development is one of the four most important reasons why people come to work. Okay. Uh, so to us, it's a massive differentiator. Uh, and the ability to upskill is not only important from a talent point of view. It's mm -hmm. usually important for serving clients well in the changing needs of the business environment, right? So uh, it's equally important in that context. Think about a world that's changing so fast. Uh, think about pre-COVID, COVID, post-COVID, post -COVID, right? What's happened to supply chains? Uh, you know, what's happened to digital marketing, what's right. happened to technology, what's happened to the ups and downs in employment, uh, the macroeconomic changes happening in the, uh, in the in the world. Now, when you put all of this together, it's about rapid change and discontinuous change. In that scheme of things, new skills become relevant with every mm -hmm. change that happens. And when those new skills become relevant, those companies which have the ability to do this fast and do this well will clearly have a competitive advantage. It's not rocket science, right? Uh, and therefore, to us, it's a differentiator for talent. It's a differentiator for winning in the marketplace, both with clients and with people. But then do you think that internal upskilling of your employee base will help in the high attrition level across companies and across industries today? 100%. See, think about it this way. If I'm able to upskill talent in a way that's relevant to my clients and relevant to the way my company is growing, mm -hmm. those employees will grow with us as well. And when they grow with us, they will see career development. They will see their skills as being more relevant to what's required in the marketplace. And therefore, it will lead to lower attrition and better engagement in that group. Now, as skills change, based on what's required in the market, mm -hmm. my ability to quickly adjust the engine to be able to change the skill stock of the company will become even more relevant. So uh, not only is it usually important from a retention point of view, it's usually important from an engagement and an employee growth point of view. Okay, fair enough. 
According to you, what are some of the key trends that you're witnessing with regards to upskilling and reskilling of workforces, not just, you know, paying attention to how to lower down nutrition, you know, not just one aspect, but what according to you are few trends that you've been witnessing over the years in the upskilling and reskilling segment? See, number one, I think one of the most important things we are saying is that learning has to be or upskilling has to be in the context of the company. Okay. And in the context of the manner in which we serve our clients and the promise that we make to our clients. So today, upskilling for me, let's take an example. If I want to upskill someone on commercial skills, the mm. context in my company, because we are a B2B company, is very mm. different than, let's say, what the context in a Unilever will be on commercial skills, right? And I'm using a specific example like commercial skills, because okay. these are two very different types of companies, right? Um, and therefore, the context becomes very relevant. The second thing is the manner in which I serve my clients needs to reflect the culture of the company if the culture of the company adds value and it is unique, right? Similarly, the learning curriculum or the upskilling curriculum has to reflect in some ways the culture of the company and the context of the company. Okay. Mm -hmm. So one of the really important trends is, look, knowledge by and large has become quite pervasive or ubiquitous. You can find knowledge pretty much anywhere. Okay. Sure. Uh, especially, you know, with the internet and all the advances being made in technology, access to knowledge is not a problem. But to ensure that that knowledge is relevant to the company will require learning professionals to very quickly be able to at scale customize this for relevance to the company. Okay. So that's the second trend. The third trend is you have to be able to leverage technology. Workforces are dispersed all over the world. And if you cannot leverage technology, the, the old answer of being able to get people into a classroom is just not practical anymore. Okay. So therefore, the leverage that you need to get from technology is massive in, in a space like this. And that will enable scale. Okay. So you get scale and technology. And then finally, the ability to be hugely agile in what we are upskilling on is absolutely mission critical. You know, the I've said this before, the half-life of most skills is now two to four years. And therefore, to be able to continue to upskill on new skills that are becoming relevant to unlearn and learn will become massively relevant. It's very beautifully explained, sir. But when it comes to, you know, companies who are trying to upscale by putting in cost to it, you know, it, it, it requires humongous amount of cost if you're coming on to upskilling uh, to few skills of your internal uh, employees. And to some extent, if you see that the return is not to an extent or even after you see that, you know, you've upskilled your respective employee base and few years or few months down the line, they go and switch on to another organization how is the upskilling and the money that you've put in to upskill your employee base giving you the results? Because at the end, they're learning from you and they're switching to another organization. How does this chain work? No, no, look, I think it's it's very simple. These are the laws of demand and supply. Uh, it's The answer doesn't lie only in, you know, uh, looking at costs and training. And what's the alternative? Don't people, don't train people. Um, then there's no relevance for you to stay in the business, yes. right? Exactly. Uh, so to me, it's not about, um, <laughs> it's not about saying, I'm going to save cost by not training or because I invest cost in training, therefore people leave, therefore... Look, at the end of the day, employers have a choice and employees have a choice as well. Okay. Right. Employers in today's environment let people go when their needs are not relevant or they're not able to deliver to their needs. If employees feel the same way, I don't see any problem with it. It creates, therefore, more pressure on us. Uh, and I think that's healthy pressure on us as employers to be able to deliver to the asks of our people, which are reasonable and fair. At the end of the day, I don't think employees are asking for anything unfair. What they're saying is, give us market relevant compensation, give us a good environment to work in, good us a, give us good managers to work with, have a purpose for the organization. And I don't think that's asking for a lot. Um, you know, the reality is, yes, when there is a fire on certain, for in terms of demand for certain skill sets, you will see a run on that talent, which is 
but the laws of demand and supply catch up to these things uh so to me it is about being a responsible employer it is about being a competitive employer um and upskilling uh, people is an essential part of that responsibility but more importantly it makes commercial sense if i upskill my talent it is people who understand the company people who are relevant to the company people who been loyal to the company and they can do bigger and bigger jobs or they can do newer and newer things so it's a win win when you talk about the role of managers i've been talking to various uh, chros and hr heads there is one thing consistently that i've heard from people is if employees leave an organization they're not leaving an organization they're actually leaving their line managers so when it comes to upskilling what is the role of line managers in boosting employees morale in order to enroll in certain you know certifications so that you know it further helps them and develop their skills because you at a at a very cxo level cannot go down to every employee and explain them you know the motive behind the company that the company is putting in terms of upskilling so here what is the role of line managers so it's hugely important um you know like you just said i think this is about multiple parts of the organization having their own specific responsibilities right there is a responsibility for the corporate organization there is a responsible responsibility for the learning organization and there is a responsibility for the supervisor as well okay the supervisor to your point is a very very critical uh catalyst in this whole process she or he uh is a coach she or he will provide an opportunity to an employee uh you know by by letting them balance their responsibilities uh by engaging in these career conversations by helping identifying the relevant skill set based on what the individual already knows or doesn't know or learns or hasn't learned so far so to your point you know hugely important uh for uh, the supervisor to be a catalyst in this process according to you now when we talking about the industry on the whole if we come down to genpack what is genpack strategy going forward to acquire and retain future ready talent look uh, like you know like you said already um, it is it is uh, our common mission across the company to be future ready uh, and it is a shared need between the uh between the hr organization and the business teams uh together uh to attract and retain the best talent and to make sure that we upskill them to put them in the right value adding roles okay and therefore there are a bunch of things that we have in place starting with um you know how we acquire talent and okay. the entire life cycle of how the talent moves along with us so think about think about employee engagement which becomes hugely important in addition to learning and i'll talk to you about the learning so you know continuously engaging with employees in terms of how they're feeling in terms of their mood in terms of positive responses so on and so forth so we start with uh, you know um, an ai driven chatbot that allows us real time views 120000 employees that we have across the world okay that's genome um, if i'm not wrong so no, that's amber that's our real time uh, okay. employee we'll talk about that as well uh, employee engagement tool or uh, tool right so that gives you real time feedback at any point of time okay then is our learning infrastructure which is uh, which is called genome okay so our entire uh, learning platform uh, we've done so far 10 million hours of learning which is just a massive number if you think about it through genome okay. um uh, as i spoke to you earlier you know the context for this is knowledge is available everywhere contextualizing it to the company and then using the experts in the company to become gurus and master gurus for uh for driving learning through the company uh is the mission that we are on uh and it is one of the four most important missions from a people point of view yeah uh okay. we've leveraged technology extensively in fact uh, our learning leader for the company globally is actually a person uh with a digital background uh, so she's a hardcore digital engineer uh 
uh, who is now leading our learning initiatives across the company. Okay. Uh, um, we have, um, you know, reached out to pretty much, um, you know, 115,000, about 40,000 employees are learning actively at any point of time. So as you can see, those are reasonably, reasonably powerful um, numbers from uh, what we've been able to do on Genome. But you you told me you've logged 10, 10 million hours of learning at Genome. Has it been helpful in retaining your people as well and manage your attrition? And to what extent? For someone who's enrolled on Genome, they are twice as likely to stay with the company as someone who's not enrolled. Okay. I mean, I, I'm talking to you based on data. I'm talking to you no, based on course. data of 40,000 people. No, but then how how is it different? Is it the interface that lets them speak? Or is it the real-time information that you're talking about that you get about your employees, which you which you may not be able to get while you are directly conversing with them? No, so, so then there's a bunch of things that go in here. I was just using okay. one output metric, which is that someone who is on Genome okay. and rolled on Genome is twice as likely to stay with the company. Now, what does that tell you? What it tells you is that learning is important. Mm. Number two, if you provide that infrastructure to people, they are twice as likely to stay with you. Okay. Now, the question is, how can you take that to all 115,000 employees or to a large number of employees so that you get much better retention? And now, how do you get much better retention? Number one, it is clear that you provide them learning infrastructure. But if you engage with them better, if you give them better quality work, so I don't think there's any rocket science in how do you engage, how, how do you lower retention? You and I both work for corporate enterprises, right? Uh, right? We all come to work, right? We all know what we like and what we don't like about our work, okay? And if you try and distill that, those are, again, it gets back to quality of work, quality of manager, learning, compensation, and purpose of the company. It won't be very different for you or for me or for the bulk of 115,000 people in Genpack. So to the question you are asking me as to how do we ensure better retention, right. we ensure better retention by making sure that we provide quality input on each of these four different areas. Okay. Okay. So, you know, I was reading a few reports the other day and according to Gartner, 58% of the current workforce needs new skill sets to do their jobs successfully in future. How, according to you, should companies strategize on upskilling their internal workforce? Because it is not the usual skill sets that we've been providing to employees on a daily basis. Now, you know, there is an advanced level of skill sets that are also expected, especially when it comes to, you know, new hires. So according to you, how should companies now devise their new age strategies of upskilling and reskilling? Great point. So it is indeed correct. Um, as we talked about earlier, the half life of most skills is now two to four years, right? So therefore, you have to continue to be able to refresh what you are upskilling for. It is equally important for new employees as well as for existing employees. In fact, I would argue that in many cases, it is more important for existing employees to really remain relevant going forward. Now, what does that mean? What that means is the implications of this are, number one, your training infrastructure has to be usually, usually agile. Because this, let's assume that today I have, through Genome, I offer learning or upskilling on 60 skill sets. Tomorrow, maybe two years from now, mm -hmm. those 60 skill sets may not be relevant anymore. Only 30 of those may be relevant and 30 new skill sets may come into place, right? Mm -hmm for which I have to build curriculum, most of which, which is available out there, but I have to contextualize it to the needs of my company. Also, I need to make sure that I have internal um, ambassadors to drive that, the expertise to be able to drive that. So making sure that we, we are ahead of the curve in identifying what those skill sets are, making sure that we have some key catalysts who can become our gurus and master gurus for those skill sets become important, then the ability to be able to bring in that curriculum and customize it. So all of which is enabled by technology. Okay. Mm -hmm. And overall, this whole thinking has to be very agile. It's kind of like a virtuous cycle. You need to, you know, keep moving really quickly. My learning 
fundamental learning in all of this has been don't look for perfection. Okay. If I'm trying to identify 30 skill sets of the future, okay, it's okay if you get five of them wrong. But in trying to get 30 of those absolutely right, if I spend six months in doing that research, I've lost an opportunity. And therefore, the ability to constantly learn, unlearn in this whole cycle itself becomes hugely important. But then when you say that you have to get your ambassadors also ready, does that mean your line managers also require upskilling and, you know, uh, a kind of workshops wherein how do they need to project the new skills or how do they need to present it? Yeah, so can see in an ideal world, you'd say everyone should be, but then, you know, you're putting the cart before the horse. If that was the case, if I could do that, then I wouldn't need the curriculum, right? So you right. need to prioritize and say, okay, if this is going to be a unique skill set of the future and I don't have it today, I'm going to go and either do accelerated learning for five people in this space so that they can become my gurus. So that they can learn this skill set and then they can they can bring in all the infrastructure or all the materials available from outside, contextualize it to the need of the company and create a curriculum so that I can use their knowledge and technology to be able to train, let us make the 5,000 people in that skill set in the next three to six months. But if I start with saying I want to train all line managers, uh, you know, I put the cart before the horse, I mean, if, if I had the ability to do that well, then I would need this. Fair enough. Lastly, in this year's budget, Pradhan Mantri has launched a skill development scheme and programs. According to you, so the committee was set up last in the last budget only, last year only. So we had the skills committee. But this year, now he's launched a full-fledged program. According to you, will that generate more employment opportunities for freshers, as well as, uh, you know, for the newbies, or do you think that the employment numbers will remain the same? No, I think you're asking me a rhetorical question, Sugand. I, I think, uh, you know, this will surely have impact. Why would it not have impact? Uh, and it's it's fantastic that the, uh, that the government at its highest levels uh, continues to think about skill building and, and upskilling in the way that they, you know, in the way that's required for the world going forward. So there have been a bunch of initiatives before this. And, you know, this is another one which I think will have, um, uh, you know, definitely move the needle going forward. But uh, private enterprises are very adept at, you know, making such strategies. Do you think there's certain companies, I mean, government should initiate this conversation that, you know, they should collaborate with few firms and actually design how the skill outlook should be like? Or do you think that, you know, they are well versed in making such strategies? No, I think, uh, look, I mean, it's not one at the exclusion of the other. No, uh, You know, I used to have this... Uh, uh, discussion with a few colleagues saying, look, I mean, you know, there are so many, for example, engineering colleges that have opened up in India, or there are so mm -hmm. many colleges in general that have opened up in India. Uh, should we focus on the quality of education rather than the number of educational setups that we set up, that we put in place? Uh, at least my view on this was that we are at a stage in this country of, you know, more than a billion people that you can't take care of everything. If you decide that I'm going to take care of quality as well as volume, uh, one will one will result in a challenge on the other. You know, you will not be able to move the needle meaningfully, therefore. So to me, the answer, at least at a certain stage and for a certain skill set, lies in volume and scale. Uh, and yes, while quality is important, uh, we don't live in an ideal world. And therefore, any initiative in this space to me is meaningful. All right. So thank you so much for joining us and sharing your insights onto this very enthralling topic. People hearing this would have a lot many questions as well. I would request everybody to please ask all your questions, tagging Mr. Piyush on uh, LinkedIn as well as Twitter, wherever you want. And he'll be happy to, you know, answer all your queries and give out solutions to the problems that people are facing. But thank you again, sir, so much for joining us. PW People is highly obliged we're talking to you. And we were thrilled to hearing your insights as well because it had anecdotes, it had facts. So yes, the session was very enthralling. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. Thank you, Sugan, for having me on your, your um, program once again. Uh, pleasure talking to you.